Phase the first, the maiden. On an evening in the latter part of May, a middle-aged man was walking homeward from Shaston to the village of Marlott, in the adjoining Vale of Blakemore, or Blackmore. The pair of legs that carried him were rickety, and there was a bias in his gait which inclined him somewhat to the left of a straight line. He occasionally gave a smart nod, as if in confirmation of some opinion, though he was not thinking of anything in particular. An empty egg basket was slung upon his arm. The nap of his hat was ruffled, a patch being quite worn away at its brim, where his thumb came in taking it off. Presently he was met by an elderly person astride on a grey mare, who as he rode hummed a wandering tune. "'Good night, T,' said the man with the basket. "'Good night, Sir John,' said the parson. The pedestrian, after another pace or two, halted and turned round. "'Now, sir, begging your pardon.' We met last market day on this road about this time, and I said good night, and you made reply good night, Sir John, as now. I did, said the parson, and once before that, near a month ago, I may have. Then what might your meaning be in calling me Sir John these different times when I be plain Jack, Derbyfield, the Hagler? The parson rode a step or two nearer. It was only my whim, he said and after a moment's hesitation, it was on account of a discovery I made some little time ago, whilst I was hunting a pedigrees for the new country history. I am Parson Tringham, the antiquary of Stagefoot Lane. Don't you really know, Derbyfield, that you are the lineal representative of the ancient and knightly family of the Dubervilles, who derived their descent from Sir Pagan Duberville, that renowned knight who came from Normandy with William the Conqueror, as n appears by Battle Abbey Roll. Never heard it before, sir. Well, it's true. Throw up your chin a moment, so that I may catch the profile of your face better. Yes, that's the Duberville nose and chin, a little debased. Your ancestor was one of the twelve knights who assisted the Lord of Estremavia in Normandy in his conquest of Glamorsgrenshire. Branches of your family held manors over all this part of England. Their names appear in the pipe rolls in the time of King Stephen. In the reign of King John, one of them was rich enough to give a manor to the knights' hospitallers. And in Edward the Second's time, your forefather, Brian, was summoned to Westminster to attend the great council there. You declined a little in Oliver Cromwell's time, but to no serious extent. And in Charles the Second's reign, you were made knights of the Royal Oak for your loyalty. Aye, there have been generations of Sir John's among you, and if knighthood were hereditary, like a baronetcy, as it practically was in old times, when men were knighted from father to son, you would be Sir John now. You don't say. In short, concluded the parson, decisively smacking his leg with his switch, there's hardly such another family in England. Daze my eyes, and isn't there? said Derbyfield. And here have I been knocking about year after year from pillar to post as if I know, was no more than the commonest feller in the parish. And how long have this news been known about Parson Tringham? The clergyman explained that as far as he was aware, it had quite died out of knowledge and could hardly be said to be known at all. His own investigations had begun on a day in the preceding spring when, having been engaged in tracing the vicissitudes of the Duberville family, he had observed Derbyfield's name on his wagon, and had thereupon been led to make inquiries about his father and grandfather till he had no doubt on the subject. At first I was resolved not to disturb you with such a useless piece of information, said he. However, our impulses are too strong for our judgment sometimes. I thought you might perhaps know something of it all the while. Well, I have heard once or twice tis true that my family had seen better days before they came to Blackmore, but I took no notice on it, thinking it to mean that we once kept two horses where now we keep only one. I've got a world wooled silver spoon and a wooled graven seal at home too, but Lord, what's a spoon and seal? And to think that I and these noble Dubervilles were one flesh all the time. "'Twas said that my great-grandfather had secrets "'and didn't care to talk of all of where he came from. "'And where do we raise our smoke now, parson? "'If I do make bold so myself, "'I mean, where do we Dubervilles live? "'You don't live anywhere. "'You are extinct as a county family. 
That's bad. Yes. What the Mendacious family chronicles call extinct in the male line, that is, gone down, gone under. Then where do we lie? At Kingsbury sub Greenhill, rows and rows of you in your vaults with your effigies under Perbeck marble canopies. And where be our family mansions and estates? You haven't any. Oh? No lands neither? None. Though you once had them in abundance, as I said, for your family consisted of numerous branches in this county, there was a seat of yours at Kingsbury, and another at Sherton, and another at Millpond, and another at Lulstead, and another at Wellbridge. And shall we ever come into our own again? Ugh, that I can't tell. And what had I better do about it, sir? asked Derbyfield after a pause. Oh, nothing, nothing, except chasten yourself with the thought of how are the mighty fallen. It is a fact of some interest to the local historian and genealogist, nothing more. There are several families among the cottagers of this county of almost equal luster. Good night. But you'll turn back and have a quart of beer with me on strength on it. Parson Tringham, that's a very pretty brew in tap of the pure drop, though, to be sure, not so good as Rolliver's. No, thank you. Not this evening, Derbyfield. You've had enough already. Concluding thus, the parson rode on his way, with doubts as to his direction in retailing the curious bit of lore. When he was gone, Derbyfield walked a few steps in a profound reverie, and then sat down upon the grassy bank by the roadside, depositing the basket before him. In a few minutes, a youth appeared in the distance, walking in the same direction as that which had been pursued by Derbyfield. The latter, on seeing him, held up his hand, and the lad quickened his pace and came near. "'Boy, take up that basket. I want ye to go on an errand for me.' The lathe-like stripling frowned. "'Who be you, then, John Derbyfield, to order me about and call me boy? You know my name well as I know yours.' "'Do you, do you. That's the secret, that's the secret. Now obey my orders and take the message. I'm going to charge with ye. "'Well, Fred,' I don't mind telling you that the secret is that I'm one of a noble race. It had been just found out by me this present afternoon p.m. And as he made the announcement, Derbyfield, declining from his sitting position, luxuriously stretched himself out upon the bank among the daisies. The lad stood before Derbyfield and contemplated his length from crown to toe. Sir John Duberville. That's who I am, continued the prostrate man. That is, if knights be baronets, which they be, tis recorded in history all about me. Dost know of such a place, lad, as Kingsbury sub Greenhill? Ease. I've been to Greenhill Fair. Well, under the church of that city, there lying. Tis in a city, the place I mean. Leastwise, twasn't when I was there. Twas a little one eyed, blinking sort of place. Never you mind the place, boy. That's not the question before us. Under the church of that there parish lie my ancestors, hundreds of them, in coats of mail and jewels, in great lead coffins weighing tons and tons. There's not a man in the country of South Wessex that's not a grander and nobler skeletons in his family than I. Oh, now take up that basket and go on to Marlant. And when you've come to the pure drop in, tell him to send a horse and carriage to me immediately, and carry me home. And in the bottom of the carriage there may be put to a noggin a rum in this small bottle and chalk it up to my account. And when you've done that, go on to my house with the basket and tell me wife to put away the washing, because she needn't finish it. And wait till I come home and I've got some news to tell her. As the lad stood in a dubious attitude, Derbyfield put his hand in his pocket and produced a shilling one of the chronically few he had possessed. Here's for your labor, lad. This made a difference in the young man's estimate of this position. Yes, Sir John, thank ye. Anything else I can do for you, Sir John? Tell him at home that I should like for supper. Well, lamb's fry if they can get it, and if they can't, black pot. And if they can't get that, well, chitterlings will do. Yes, Sir John. The boy took up the basket and as he set out, the notes of a brass band were heard from the direction of the village. What's that? said Derbyfield. Not on account of I. Tis the women's club walk-in, Sir John. Why, your daughter is one of the members. To be sure, I'd quite forgotten in my thoughts of greater things. 
Well, vamp on to Marlet, ye will ye, and under that carriage, and maybe I'll drive round and inspect the club. The lad departed, and Derbyfield lay waiting on the grass and daisies in the evening sun. Not a soul passed that way for a long while, and the faint notes of the band were the only human sound audible within the rim of the blue hills. Two. The village of Marlot lay amid the northeastern undulations of the beautiful Vale of Blakemore, or Blackmore, aforesaid an engirdled and secluded region, for the most part untrodden as yet by tourist or landscape painter. Though within a four hours' journey from London, it is a vale whose acquaintance is best made by viewing it from the summits of the hills that surround it, except perhaps during the droughts of summer. An unguided ramble into its recesses in bad weather is apt to engender dissatisfaction with its narrow, tortuous, and miry ways. This fertile and sheltered tract of country in which the fields are never brown and the springs never dry is bounded on the south by the bold chalk ridge that embraces the prominences of Hambledon Hill, Bullbarrow, Nettlecombe Tout, Dogbury, Highstoy, and Bubdown. The traveller from the coast, who, after plodding northward for a score of miles over calcareous downs and cornlands, suddenly reaches the verge of one of those escarpments, is surprised and delighted be to behold, extended like a map beneath him, a country differing absolutely from that which he has passed through. Behind him the hills are open, the sun blazes down upon fields so large as to give the enclosure character to the landscape. The lanes are white, the hedges low and plashed, the atmosphere colorless. Here in the valley the world seems to be constructed upon a smaller and more delicate scale. The fields are mere paddocks, so reduced that from their height their hedgerows appear a network of dark green threads overspreading the paler green of the grass. The atmosphere beneath is languorous and is so tinged with azure that what artists call the middle distance partakes also of that hue, while the horizon beyond is of the deepest ultramarine. Arable lands are few and limited, with but slight exceptions. The prospect is a broad, rich mass of grass and trees mantling minor hills and dales within the major such as the Vale of Blakemore. The district is of historic no less than of topographical interest. The Vale was known in former times as the Forest of White Hart, from a curious legend of King Henry III's reign, in which the killing by a certain Thomas de la Linde of a beautiful White Hart, which the king had run down and spared, was made the occasion of a heavy fine. In those days, and till comparatively recent times, the country was densely wooded. Even now, traces of its earlier condition are to be found in the old oak copses and irregular belts of timber that yet survive upon its slopes, and the hollow-trunked trees that shade so many of its pastures. The forests had departed, but some old customs of their shades remain. Many, however, linger only in a metamorphosed or disguised form. The May Day dance, for instance, was to be discerned on an afternoon under notice in the guise of the club revel or club walking, as it was there called. It was an interesting event to the younger inhabitants of Marlot, though its real interest was not observed by the participators in the ceremony. Its singularity lay less in the retention of a custom of walking in procession and dancing on each anniversary than in the members being solely women. In men's clubs, such celebrations were, though expiring, less uncommon. But either the natural shyness of the softer sex or a sarcastic attitude on the part of the male relatives had denuded such women's clubs as remained, if any others did, or this their glory and consummation. The club of Marlot alone lived to uphold the local Cyrilia. It had walked for hundreds of years, if not as benefit club, as votive sister of some sort, and it walked still. The banded ones were all dressed in white gowns, a gay survival from old-style days, when cheerfulness and maytime were synonyms, days before the habit of making long views had reduced emotions to a monotonous average, their first exhibition of themselves was in a processional march of two and two round the parish. Ideal and real clashed slightly as the sun lit up their figures against the green hedges and creeper-laced house fronts. For though the whole troop wore white garments, no two whites were alike among them. 
Some approached pure blanching, some had a bluish pallor, some worn by older characters which had possibly lain by, folded for many a year, inclined to a cadaverous tint and to a Georgian style. In addition to the distinction of a white frock, every woman and girl carried in her right hand a peeled willow wand, and in her left a bunch of white flowers. The peeling of the former and the selection of the latter had been an operation of personal care. There were a few middle-aged and even elderly women in the train, their silvery, wiry hair and wrinkled faces scourged by time and trouble, having almost a grotesque, certainly a pathetic, appearance in such a jaunty situation. In a true view, perhaps, there was more to be gathered and told of each anxious and experienced one to whom the years were drawing nigh when she would say, I have no pleasure in them, than of her juvenile comrades. But let the elder be passed over here, for those under whose bodices the life throbbed quick and warm, the young girls formed, indeed, the majority of the band, and their heads of luxuriant hair reflected in the sunshine every tone of gold and black and brown. Some had beautiful eyes, others had beautiful nose, others a beautiful mouth and figure, few if any had all. A difficulty in arranging their lips in this crude exposure to public scrutiny, an inability to balance their heads and to disassociate self-consciousness from their features, was apparent in them, and showed that they were genuine country girls, unaccustomed to many eyes, and as each and all of them were warmed without by the sun, so each had a private life sun for her soul to bask in. Some dream, some affection, some hobby, at least some remote and distant hope which, though perhaps starving to nothing, still lived on, as hopes will. They were all cheerful, and many of them merry. They came round by the pure drop-in, and were turning out of the high road to pass through a wicket-gate into the meadows when one of the women said, The load o' lord, why test Derby Field if there isn't the father riding home in a carriage? A young member of the band turned her head as the exclamation. She was a fine and handsome girl, not handsomer than some of the others, possibly. But her mobile pan and mouth and large, innocent eyes added eloquence to color and shape. She wore a red ribbon in her hair and was the only one of the white company who could boast of such a pronounced adornment. As she looked round Derbyfield, was seen moving along the road in a chaise belonging to the pure drop, driven by a frizzle-headed brawny damsel with her gown sleeves rolled above her elbows. This was the cheerful servant of that establishment who in her part of factotum turned groom and ostler at times. Derbyfield, leaning back and with his eyes closed luxuriously, was waving his hand above his head and singing in a slow recitative, I've got a great family vault at Kingsbury, and knighted forefathers in lead coffins there. The clubists tittered, except the girl called Tess, in whom a slow heat seemed to rise at the sense that her father was making himself foolish in their eyes. He's tired, that's all, she said hastily, and he has got a lift home, because our own horse has to rest today. Bless thy simplicity, Tess, said her companions. He's got that market niche. Ha ha. Look here. I won't walk another inch with you if you say any jokes about him, Tess cried, and the color upon her cheeks spread over her face and neck. In a moment her eyes grew moist and the glance drooped to the ground. Perceiving that they had really pained her, they said no more, and a order again prevailed. Tess's pride would not allow her to turn her head again, to learn what her father's meaning was if he had any, and thus she moved on with the whole body to the enclosure where there was to be the dancing on the green. By the time the spot was reached she had recovered her equanimity and tapped her neighbor with her wand and talked as usual. Tess Derbyfield at the time of her life was a mere vessel of emotion and untinctured by experience. The dialect was on her tongue to some ex extent despite the village school, the characteristic intonation of that dialect, for the district being the voicing approximately rendered by the syllable er. 
probably as rich in utterance as any to be found in human speech. The pouted up, deep red mouth into which this syllable was native had hardly as yet settled into its definitive shape, and her lower lip had a way of thrusting the middle of her top one upward when they closed together after a word. Phases of her childhood lurked in her aspect still, as she walked along today, for all her bouncing handsomeness, womanliness, you could sometimes see her twelfth year in her cheeks, or her ninth sparkling from her eyes, and even her fifth would flit over the curves of her mouth now and then. Yet few knew, and still fewer considered this. A small minority, mainly strangers, would look long at her in her casually passing by, and grow momentarily fascinated by her freshness, and wonder if they would ever see her again. But to almost everybody, she was a fine and picturesque country girl, and no more. Nothing was seen or heard further of Derbyfield in his triumphal chariot under the conduct of the Austerless, and the club having entered the allotted space, dancing began. And there were no men in the company. The girls danced at first with each other, but when the hour for the close of labor drew on, the masculine inhabitants of the village, together with other idlers and pedestrians, gathered round the spot and then peered and climbed to negotiate for a partner. Among these onlookers were three young men of a superior class, carrying small knapsacks strapped to their shoulders and stout sticks in their hands. Their general likeness to each other and their consecutive ages was almost have suggested that they might be what in fact they were brothers. The eldest wore the white tie, high waistcoat, and thin-brimmed hat of the regulation curate. The second was the normal undergraduate, the appearance of the third and youngest would hardly have been sufficient to characterize him. There was an unscribbed, uncombined aspect in his eyes and attire implying that he had hardly as yet found the entrance to his professional groove, that he was a desultory, tentative student of something, and everything might only have been predicted of him. These three brethren told casual acquaintances that they were spending their wits and holidays in a walking tour through the Vale of Blackmore, their course being southwesterly from the town of Shaston on the northeast. They leant over the gate by the highway and inquired as to the meaning of the dance and the white-frocked maids. The two elder of the brothers were plainly not intending to linger more than a moment, but the spectacle of a bevy of girls dancing without male partners seemed to amuse the third and make him in no hurry to move on. He unstrapped his knapsack, put it with his stick on the hedge bank, and opened the gate. "'What are you going to do, Angel?' asked the eldest. "'I am inclined to go and have a fling with them. Why not all of us? Just for a moment or two. It will not detain us long.' "'No nonsense,' said the first. "'Dancing in public with a troop of country hoydens, suppose we should be seen. Come on. Or if it will be dark before we get to Stour Castle, and there's no place we can sleep at nearer than, than that. Besides, we must get through another chapter of a counterblast of agnosticism before we turn in. Now I have taken the trouble to bring the book. All right. I'll overtake you and Cuthbert in five minutes. Don't stop. I give my word that I will, Felix. The two elder reluctantly left him, and walked on talking their brother's knapsacks, and... To relieve him in following, and the youngest entered the field. This is a thousand pities, he said gallantly, and to two or three of the girls nearest him, as soon as there was a pause in the dance, Where are your partners, my dears? They've not left off work yet, answered one of the boldest. They'll be here by and by, till then will you be one, sir? Certainly, but what's one among so many? Better than none. "'Tis melancholy work, facing and footin' it to one of your own sort, and no clipsin' and callin' at all. Now pick and choose.' Shh, "'Don't be so forward,' said a shire girl. The young man, thus invited, glanced them over and attempted some discrimination, but as the group were all so new to him, he could not very well exercise it. He took almost the first that came to hand— which was not the speaker, as she had expected, nor did it happen to be Tess Derbyfield. Pedigree, ancestral skeletons, monumental record, the Duberville lineament, did not help Tess in her life's battle as yet, even to the extent of attracting to her dancing partner over the heads of the commonest pedantry. 
So much for Norman Blood, unaided by Victorian lucre. The name of the eclipsing girl, whatever it was, has not been handed down. But she was envied by all as the first who enjoyed the luxury of a masculine partner that evening. Yet such was the force of example that the village young men, who had not hastened to enter the gate while no intruder was in the way, now dropped in quickly. And soon the couples became leavened with rustic youth to a marked extent, till at length the plainest women in the club were no longer compelled to foot it to the masculine side of the figure. The church clock struck when suddenly the student said that he must leave. He had been forgetting himself. He had to join his companions. As he fell out of the dance, his eyes lighted on Tess Derbyfield, whose own large orbs wore, to tell the truth, the faintest aspect of reproach that he had not chosen her. He too was sorry then that, owing to her backwardness, he had not observed her, and with that in his mind, he left the pasture. On account of his long delay, he started in a flying run down the lane westward, and had soon passed the hollow and mounted the next rise. He had not yet overtaken his brothers, but he paused to get breath and looked back. He could see the white figures of the girls in the green enclosure whirling about as they had whirled when he was among them. They seemed to have quite forgotten him already, all of them except perhaps one. This white shape stood apart by the hedge alone. From her position he knew it to be the pretty maiden with whom he had not danced. Trifling as the matter was, he yet instinctively felt that she was hurt by his oversight. He wished that he had asked her. He wished that he had inquired her name. She was so modest, so expressive. She had looked so soft in her thin white gown that he felt he had acted stupidly. However, it could not be helped, and turning and bending himself to a rapid walk, he dismissed the subject from his mind. 3. As for Tess Derbyfield, she did not so easily dislodge the incident from her consideration. She had no spirit to dance again for a long time, though she might have had plenty of partners, but ah, they did not speak so nicely as the strange young man had done. It was not till the rays of the sun had absorbed the young stranger's retreating figure on the hill that she shook off her temporary sadness and answered her would-be partner in the affirmative. She remained with her comrades till dusk and participated with a certain zest in the dancing, though being heart-whole as yet, she enjoyed treading a measure purely for its own sake little divining when she saw the soft torments, the bitter sweets, the pleasing pains, and the agreeable distresses of those girls who had been wooed and won, what she herself was capable of in that kind. The struggles and wrangles of the lads for her kind, for her hand in a jig, were an amusement to her, no more, and when they became fierce she rebuked them. She might have stayed even later, but the incident of her father's odd appearance and manner returned upon the girl's mind and made her anxious, and wondering what had become of him, she dropped away from the dancers and bent her steps towards the end of the village at which the parental cottages lay. While they yet many scores yards off, other rhythmic sounds than those she had quitted became audible to her, sounds that she knew well so well. There were a regular series of thumpings from the interior of the house, occasioned by the violent rocking of a cradle upon a stone floor, to which movement a feminine voice kept the time, saying, in a vigorous gallopede, the favorite ditty of the spotted cow, I saw her lie down in yonder, green grove, come love, and I'll tell you where. The cradle rocking and the song would cease simultaneously for a moment, and an exclamation at highest vocal pitch would take the place of the melody. God bless thy dimmest eyes, and thy waxy cheeks, and thy cherry mouth, and thy cupid's thighs, and thy bit of thy blessed body. After this invocation, the rocking and the singing would recommence, and the spotted cow proceeded as before. No matters... So matters stood when Tess opened the door and paused upon the mat within it, surveying the scene. The interior, in spite of the melody, struck upon the girl's senses with an unspeakable dreariness. 
from the holiday gaieties of the field, the white gowns, the nosegays, the willow wands, the whirling movements on the green, the flash of gentle sentiment toward the stranger, to the yellow melancholy of this once candled spectacle. What a step! Besides the jar of contrast, there came to her a chill self-reproach that she had not returned sooner to help her mother in these domesticities instead of indulging herself out of doors. There stood her mother amid the group of children as Tess had left her, hanging over the Monday washing tub, which had now as always lingered on the end of the week. Out of the tub had come the day before. Tess felt it with a dreadful sting of remorse. The very white frock upon her back, which she had so carelessly greened upon the skirt on the damping grass, which had been wrung up and ironed by her mother's own hands. As usual, Mrs. Derbyfield was balanced on one foot beside the tub, the other being engaged in the aforesaid business of rocking her youngest child. The cradle rockers had done hard duty for so many years, under the weight of so many children, on that flagstone floor that they were worn nearly flat in consequence of which a huge jerk accompanied each swing of the cot, flinging the baby from side to side like a weaver's shuttle, as Mrs. Derbyfield, excited by her song, trod the rocker with all the spring that was left in her after a long day's seething in the suds. Nick-knock, nick-knock went the cradle. The candle flame stretched itself tall and began jiggling up and down. The water dribbled from the matron's elbows, and the song galloped on to the end of the verse. Mrs. Derbyfield regarding her daughter the while. Even now, when burdened with a young family, Joan Derbyfield was a passionate lover of tune. No ditty floated into Blackmore Vale from the outer world, but Tess's mother caught up its notation in a week. There still faintly beamed from the woman's features something of the freshness and even the prettiness of her youth, rendering it probable that the personal charms which Tess could boast of were in main part her mother's gift, and therefore unknightly, unhistorical. "'I'll rock the cradle for ye, mother,' said the daughter gently, "'or I'll take off my best frock and help you ring up. I thought you had finished long ago.' Her mother bore Tess no ill will for leaving the housework to her single-handed efforts for so long. Indeed, Joan seldom upbraided her thereon, at any time feeling but slightly the lack of Tess's assistance whilst her instinctive plan for relieving herself of her labors lay in postponing them. Tonight, however, she was even in a blither mood than usual. There was a dreaminess, a preoccupation, an exaltation in the maternal look, which the girl could not understand. "'Well, I'm glad you've come,' her mother said, as soon as the last note had passed out of her. "'I want to go and fetch your father, but what's more than that, I want to tell ye what ye have happened. "'You'll be fess enough, my poppet, when this no.' Mrs. Derbyfield habitually spoke the dialect her daughter, who had passed the sixth standard in the national school under a London-trained mistress, spoke two languages, the dialect at home, more or less, ordinary English abroad, and to persons of quality. "'Since I've been away?' Tess asked. "'Ay. Had it anything to do with father's making such a moment of himself a thick carriage this afternoon? Why did her? I felt inclined to sink in the ground with shame. That were all part of the larry. We've been found to be the greatest gentlefolk in the whole country.' Reaching all backlog before Oliver Grumble's time into the days of the pagan Turks with monuments and vaults and crests and scutcheons and the Lord knows what all. In St. Charles's day, we was made knights of the Royal Oak, our real name being Duberville. Don't that make your bosom plim? "'Twas on this account that your father rode home in the Vlee, not because he'd been drinking, as people supposed. I'm glad of that. Will it be good as us any good, mother?" Oh, yes, tis thought it that great things might come of it. No doubt a mumpus, a volk, or our own rank will be down here with their carriages as soon as tis known. Your father learnt it this way home from Shaston, and he'd been telling me all the pedigree the whole matter. Where is father now? asked Tess suddenly. Her mother gave irrelevant information by way of answer. He called to see the doctor today in Shaston. It is not cons consumption as at all, it seems. It is fat round the heart, I says. There, it is like this. 
Joan Derbyfield, as she spoke, curved a sudden thumb and forefinger to the shape of the letter C and used the other forefinger as a pointer. At the present moment, he says to your father, your heart is enclosed all round there and all round there. This space is still open, I says, as soon as to do meet. So, Mrs. Derbyfield closed her fingers in a circle complete. Off you will go like a shatter, Mrs. Mr. Derbyfield, I says. You mid last ten years. You mid go off in ten months or ten days. Tess looked alarmed. Her father possibly to go behind the eternal cloud so soon, notwithstanding this sudden great greatness. But where is father? She asked again. Her mother put on a deprecating look. Now don't you be bursting out angry. The poor man, he felt so rafted up his uplifting by the parson's news that he went up to Rolliver's half an hour ago. He do want to get up his strength for his journey tomorrow with that load of beehives which must be delivered family or no. He'll have to start shortly after twelve tonight as the distance is so long. Get up his strength, said Tess impetuously, the tears welling to her eyes. Oh my God, go to a public house to get up his strength, and you as well agreed as he, mother. Her rebuke and her mood seemed to fill the whole room and to impart a cowed look to the furniture and candle, and children playing about into her mother's face. No, said the latter touchily, I be not agreed. I have been waiting for ye to bide and keep house while I go fetch him. I'll go. Oh no, Tess, you see it would be no use. Tess did not expostulate. She knew what her mother's objection meant. Mrs. Derbyfield's jacket and bonnet were already hanging silly, slyly upon a chair by her side. In readiness for this contemplated jaunt, the reason for which the matron deplored more than its necessity. And take the complete fortune teller to the outhouse, Joan continued, rapidly wiping her hands and donning the garments. The complete fortune teller was an old thick volume, which lay on a table on her elbow, so worn by pickpocketing that the margins had reached the edge of the type. Tess took it up and her mother started. This going to hunt up her shiftless husband at the inn was one of Mrs. Derbyfield's still extant enjoyments in the muck and muddle of rearing children. To discover him at Rolliver's, to sit there for an hour or two by his side, and dismiss all thought and care of his children, during the interval made her happy. A sort of halo, an occidental glow, came over life then. Troubles and other realities took on themselves a metaphysical impalability, sinking to mere mental phenomena for serene contemplation, and no longer stood as pressing concretions which chafed body and soul. The youngsters not immediately within sight seemed rather bright and desirable appurtenances than otherwise. The incidents of daily life were not without humorousness and jollity in their aspect there. She felt a little as she had used to feel when she sat by her now wedded husband in the same spot during his wooing, shutting her eyes to his defects of character and regarding him only in his ideal presentation as a lover. Tess, being left alone with the younger children, went first to the outhouse with the fortune-telling book and stuffed it into the thatch. A curious fetishistic fear of this grimy volume on the part of her mother prevented her ever allowing it to stay in the house all night, and hither it was brought back whenever it was, had been consulted between the mother with her fast-perishing lumber of superstitions, folklore, dialect, and orally transmitted ballads, and the daughter with her trained national teachings and standard knowledge under an infinitely revised code. There was a gap of two hundred years as ordinarily understood. When they were together, the Jacobian and the Victorian ages were juxtaposed. Returning along the garden path, Tess mused on what the mother could have wished to ascertain from the book on that particular day. She guessed the recent ancestral discovery to bear upon it, but did not divine that it solely concerned herself. Dismissing this, however, she busied herself with sprinkling the linen dried during the daytime in company with her nine-year-old brother Abraham and her sister Eliza Louisa, of twelve and a half, called Liza Lou. 
The youngest ones being put to bed, there was an interval of four years and more between Tess and the next of the family, the two who had filled the gap having died in their infancy, and this lent her a deputy maternal attitude when she was alone with her juniors. Next in juvenility to Abraham came two more girls, Hope and Modesty, then a boy of three, and then the baby, who had just completed his first year. All these young souls were passengers on the Dubir Field ship, entirely dependent on the judgment of the two Derby Field adults for their pleasure, their necessities, their health, even their existence. If the heads of the Derby Field household chose to sail into difficulty, disaster, starvation, disease, degradation, death, thither were all half dozen little captives under hatches compelled to sail with them six helpless creatures who had never been asked if they wished for life on any terms much less if they wished for it on such hard conditions as were involved in being of the shiftless house of Derbyfield. some people would like to know whence the poet whose philosophy is in these days deemed as profound and trustworthy as his song is breezy and pure gets his authority for speaking of nature's holy plan it grew later, and neither father nor mother reappeared. Tess looked out of the door and took a mental journey through Marlon. The village was shutting its eyes. Candles and lamps were being put out everywhere. She could inwardly behold the extinguisher and the extended hand. Her mother's fetching simply meant one more to fetch. Tess began to perceive that a man in indifferent health, who proposed to start on a journey before one in the morning, ought not to be at the inn in this late hour celebrating an ancient blood. Abraham, she said to her little brother, do you put on your hat, you bain't afraid, and go up to Rolliver's and see what has gone with father and mother? The boy jumped promptly from his seat and opened the door, and the night swallowed him up. Half an hour passed, yet again neither man, woman, nor child returned. Abraham, like his parents, seems to have been limed and caught by the ensnaring in. I must go myself, she said. Liza Lou then went to bed, and Tess, locking them all in, started on her way up to the dark and crooked lane or street, made not for hasty progress, a street laid out before inches of land had value, and when one-handed clocks sufficiently subdivided the day. 4. Rolliver's Inn the single alehouse at this end of the long and broken village could only boast of an awful essence. Hence, as nobody could legally drink on the premises, the amount of overt accommodation for consumers was strictly limited to a little board about six inches wide and two yards long, fixed to the garden palings by pieces of wire so as to a form of ledge. On this board, thirsty strangers deposited their cups as they stood in the road and drank, and threw the dregs on the dusty ground the pattern of Polynesia, and whilst they could have restful seat inside. Thus the strangers, but there were also local customers, who felt the same wish, and were there's a will, there's a way. In a large bedroom upstairs, the window of which was thickly contained with a great woolen shawl lately discarded by the landlady, Mrs. Rolliver, were gathered on this evening nearly a dozen persons, all seeking beatitude, all old inhabitants of the nearer end of Marlott, and the frequenters of this retreat. Not only did the distance to the prayer drop, the fully licensed tavern at the furthest part of the dispersed village, render its accommodation practically unavailable for dwellers at this end, but the far more serious question, the quality of the liquor, confirmed the prevalent opinion that it was better to drink with Rolliver in a corner of the housetop than with the other landlord in a wide house. Gaunt four-post bedstead which stood in the room afforded sitting space for several persons gathered round three of its sides. A couple more men had elevated themselves on a chest of drawers, another rested on the oak-carved coiffer. Two on the washstand, another on the stool, and thus all were, somehow, seated at their ease. 
The stage of mental comfort to which they had arrived at this hour was one wherein their souls expanded beyond their skins and spread their personalities warmly through the room. In this process, the chamber and its furniture grew more and more dignified and luxurious. The shawl hanging at the window took upon itself the richness of tapestry. The brass handles of the chest of drawers were his golden knockers, and the carved bedposts seemed to have some kinship with the magnificent pillars of Solomon's temple. Mrs. Derbyfield, having quickly walked hitherward after parting from Tess, opened the front door, crossed the downstairs room, which was in deep gloom, and then unfastened the stair door, which, like one whose fingers knew the tricks of the latches well, her ass, her scent of the crooked staircase was a slower process, and her face, as it rose into the light above the last stair, encountered the gaze of all the party assembled in the bedroom. Being a few private friends, I've asked in to keep a club walking at my own expense, the landlady exclaimed, at the sound of footsteps as glibly as a child repeating the catechism, while she peered over the stairs. Oh, tis you, Mrs. Derbyfield, lard, how you frightened me. I thought it might be some gaffer sent by government. Mrs. Derbyfield was welcomed with glances and nods by the remainder of the conclave, and turned to where her husband sat. He was humming absently to himself in a low tone. I be good as some folks here and there. I've had a great family vaulted Kingsbury sub Greenhill, and finer skeletons than any man in Wessex. I've something to tell thee, and that's come into my head about that. A grand project, whispered his cheerful wife. Here, John, don't you see me? She nudged him, while he, looking through her as through a window pane, went on with his recitative. Hush! Oh, he sings so loud, my good man, said the landlady. In case any member of the government should be passing and take away my license. He's told thee what's happened to us, I suppose, asked Mrs. Derbyfield. Yes, in a way. Do ye think there's any money hanging by it? Ah, that's the secret, said Joan Derbyfield sagely. However, tis well to be kin to a coach, even if you don't ride in an... She dropped her public voice and continued in a low tone to her husband. I've been thinking since you brought the news that there's a great rich lady by Taintridge on the edge of the chase of the name of Duberville. Hey, what's that? said Sir John. She repeated the information. That lady must be our relation, she said, and my project is to send Tess to claim kin. There is a lady of the name, now that you mention it, said Derbyfield. Passin' Tringham didn't think of it, but she's nothing beside we. A junior branch of us, no doubt, hailing long since King Norman's day. While the question was being discussed, neither of the pair noticed, in their preoccupation, that little Abraham had crept into the room and was awaiting an opportunity of asking them to return. She is rich, and she'd be sure to take notice of the maid, continued Mrs. Derbyfield, and twill be a very good thing. I don't see why two branches of one family shouldn't be on visiting terms. Yes, and we'll all claim kin, said Abraham brightly from under the bedstead, and we'll all go down and see when Tess has gone to live with her, and we'll ride in her coach and wear black clothes. How do you come here, child? What nonsense ye talkin'? Go away and play on the stairs till father and mother be ready. Well, Tess ought to be going down to the other member of the family. She'd be sure to win the lady, Tess would, and likely enough twould lead to some noble gentleman marrying her. In short, I know it. How? I tried her fate in the fortune teller and it brought about some very, the very thing. You should ha' seen how pretty she looked today. Her skin is so supple. As a duchess... What says the maid herself to go on? I've not asked her. She don't know there's any such lady relation yet, but it would certainly put her in a way of a grand marriage, and she won't say nay to go in. Tess is queer. But she's tractable at bottom. Leave her to me. Though this conversation had been private sufficient to the, its import 
reached the understandings of those round to suggest to them that the Derby Fields had weightier concerns to talk of now than common folk had, and that Tess, their pretty eldest daughter, had fine project, prospects in store. Tess is a fine figure of fun, as I said to myself to-day, when I zed her vampin' round parish with the rest, observed one of the elderly boozers in an undertone, but Joan Derbyfield might mind that she don't get green malt in floor. It was a local phrase which had a peculiar meaning, and there was no reply. The conversation became inconclusive, and presently other footsteps were heard crossing the room below. Being a few private friends asked in tonight to keep up club walking at my own expense, the landlady had rapidly reused the formula she kept on hand for intruders before she recognized that the newcomer was Tess. Even to her mother's gaze, the girl's young features looked sadly out of place amid the alcoholic vapors which floated here as no unsuitable medium for wrinkled middle age, and hardly was a reproachful flash from Tessa's dark eyes needed to make her father and mother rise from their seats, hastily finish their ale, and descend the stairs behind her, Mrs. Rolliver, caution, following their footsteps, no noise, please, if ye'll be so good, my dears, or I mid lose me license and be summonsed, and I don't know what all. Night tea. They went home together, Tess holding one arm of her father and Mrs. Derbyfield the other. He had in truth drunk very little, not a fourth of the quantity which assisted Maddock Tipler could carry to church on a Sunday afternoon, without a hitch in his eastings or genuflections, but the weakness of Sir John's constitution made mountains of his petty sins in this kind. In reaching the fresh air he was sufficiently unsteady, to incline the row of three at one moment as if they were marching to London, and at another as if they were marching to Bath which produced a comical effect frequent enough in families on nocturnal home-goings, and like most comical effects, not quite so comic as after all. The two women valiantly disguised their forced excursions and countermarches as well as they could from Derbyfield, their cause, and from Abraham, and from themselves. And so they approached by degrees their own door, the head of the family bursting suddenly into his former refrain as he drew near, as if to fortify his soul at sight of the smallest of his present residence. I've got a family vault in Kingsbeer. Hush, don't be so silly, Jackie, said his wife. Yours is not the only family that was of count in old days. Look at the Anktels, the Horsies, the Tringhams themselves, gone to seed almost as much as you. Though you is bigger folks than they, that's true. Thanks, God, I was never of no family and have nothing to be ashamed of in that way. Don't you be sure of that. From you, Nater, tis my belief you've disgraced yourselves more than any of us, and was kings and queens outright at any time. Tess turned the subject by saying that what was far from prominent in her mind at the moment than thoughts of her ancestry... I am afraid father won't be able to take the journey with the beehives tomorrow so early. I? I shall be all right in an hour or two, said the Derbyfield. It was eleven o'clock before the family were all in bed, and two o'clock next morning was the latest hour for starting with the beehives if they were to be delivered to the retailers in Casterbridge before the Saturday market began. The way thither, lying by bad roads over a distance of between twenty and thirty miles, and horse and wagon being of the slowest, at half-past one Mrs. Derbyfield came into the large bedroom, where Tess and all her little brothers and sisters slept. "'The poor man can't go,' she said to her eldest daughter, whose great eyes had opened the moment her mother's hand touched the door." Tess sat up in bed, lost in a vague inner space between a dream and this information. But somebody must go, she replied. It is late for the hives already. Swarming will soon be over the year. And we put off taking them till next week's market. The call for them will be passed, and they'll be thrown on our hands. Mrs. Derbyfield looked unequal to the emergency. Some young feller, perhaps, would go... One of them who was so much after dancing with ye yesterday, she presently suggested. Oh, no, 
I wouldn't have it for the world, declared Tess proudly, and letting everybody know the reason, such a thing to be ashamed of. I think I could go if Abraham could go with me to keep me company. Her mother at length agreed to this arrangement. Little Abraham was aroused from his deep sleep in a corner of the same apartment and made to put his clothes whilst still mentally in the other world. Meanwhile, Tess had hastily dressed herself, and the twain, lighting a lantern, went out to the table. The rickety little wagon was already laden, and the girl led out the horse prince, only a degree less rickety than the vehicle. The poor creature looked wonderingly round at the night, at the lantern, at their two figures, as if he could not believe that this hour, when every living thing was intended to be, to be in shelter and at rest, he was called upon to go out and labor. They put a stalk of candle ends into the lantern, hung the ladder off to the side of the load, and directed the horse onward, walking at his shoulder at first during the uphill parts of the way, in order not to overload an animal of so little vigor. To cheer themselves as well as they could, they made an artificial morning with the lantern, some bread and some butter, for their own conversation, the real morning being far from come. Abraham, as more fully awoke, for he had moved in sort of a trance from so far, began to talk of the strange shapes assumed by the various dark objects against the sky, of his tree which looked like a raging tiger springing from a lair, of that which resembled a giant's head. When they had passed the little town of Stour Castle, dumbly somnolent under its thick brown hatch, they reached higher ground, still higher on their left the elevation called Bull Barrel or Beal Barrel, well nigh to the highest in South Wessex, swelled into the sky and girdled by its earthen trenches. From hereabouts the long road was fairly level, and for some distance onward they mounted in front of the wagon and Abraham grew reflective. Tess, he said in a preparatory tone after a silence. Yes, Abraham. Bain't you glad that we've become gentlefolk? Not particular glad. "'But you be glad that you am going to marry a gentleman?' "'What?' said Tess, lifting her face. "'That our great relation will help ye to marry a gentleman. "'I, our great relation, we have no such relation. "'What has put that into your head? "'I heard him talking about it up at Rolliver's when I went to find father. "'There's a rich lady of our family, Towton Taintridge, "'and mother said that if you claimed kin with the lady, "'she'd put ye in thy way of marrying a gentleman.' Her sister became abruptly still and lapsed into a pondering silence. Abraham talked on rather for the pleasure of utterance than for audition, so that his sister, his sister's abstraction was of no account. He leant back against the hives and with upturned face made observations on the stars, whose cold pulses were beating amid the black hollows above in serene disassociation from those two wisps of human life. He asked how far away those twinklers were, and whether God was on the other side of them, but ever and anon his childish prattle recurred to what impressed his imagination even more deeply than the wonders of creation. If Tess were made rich by marrying a gentleman, would she have money enough to buy a spyglass so large that it would draw the stars as near to her as Nettlecombe Stout? The renewed subject, which seemed to have impregnated the whole family, filled Tess with impatience. Never mind that now, she exclaimed. Did you say the stars were worlds, Tess? Yes. All like ours? I don't know, but I think so. They sometimes seem to be like the apples of our stubborn tree, most of them splendid and sound, a few blighted. Which do we live on? A splendid one or a blighted one? A blighted one. "'Tis very unlucky that we didn't pitch on so sound one, when there were so many more of them. Yes. Is it like that really, Tess?' said Abraham, turning in to her, much impressed on reconsideration of this rare information. "'How would it have been if we had pitched on a sound one?' "'Well, Father wouldn't have coughed and creeped about as he does, and wouldn't have got too tipsy to go on this journey, and Mother wouldn't have taken, been always washing and never getting finished.' And you would have been a rich lady ready-made, and not have been made rich by marrying a gentleman. Oh, Aby, don't 
Don't talk of that anymore. Left to her reflections, Abraham soon drew, grew drowsy. Tess was not skillful in the management of a horse, but she thought that she could take upon herself the entire conduct of the load for the present and allow Abraham to go to sleep if he wished to do so. She made him a sort of nest in front of the hives in such a manner that he could not fall, and, taking the reins into her hands, jogged on as before. Prince required but slight attention, lacking energy for superfluous movement of any sort. With no longer a companion to distract her, Tess fell more deeply into reverie than ever. Her back leaning against the hives, the mute recession past her shoulders of trees and hedges became attached to fantastic scenes outside reality, and the occasional heave of the wind became the sigh of some immense and sad soul. Sarah Conterminous with the universe in space and with history in time. Then, examining the mesh of events in her own life, she seemed to see the vanity in her father's pride, the gentlemanly suitor awaiting herself in her mother's fancy, to see him as a grimacing personage laughing at her poverty and her shrouded knightly ancestry. Everything grew more and more extravagant, and she no longer knew how time passed. A sudden jerk shook her in her seat, and Tess awoke from the sleep into which she too had fallen. They were a long way further on than what she had lost consciousness, and the wagon had stopped. A hollow groan unlike anything she had ever heard in her life came from the front, followed by a shout of, Oi there! The lantern hanging from her wagon had gone out, but another was shining in her face, much brighter than her own had been. Something terrible had happened. The harness was entangled with an object which blocked the way. In consternation, Tess jumped down and discovered the dreadful truth. The groan had proceeded from her father's poor horse, Prince. The morning mail cart in its two noiseless wheels, speeding along those lanes like an arrow as it always did, had driven into her slow and unlighted equipage. The pointed shaft from the cart had entered the breast of the unhappy prince like a sword, and from the wound his life's blood was spouting in a stream and falling with a hiss into the road. In her despair, Tess sprang forward and put her hand upon the hole, with the only result that she became splashed from face to skirt with the crimson drops. Then she stood helplessly looking on. Prince also stood firm and motionless as long as he could till he suddenly sank down in a heap. By this time, the mail cart man had joined her and began dragging and unharnessing the hot form of Prince, but he was already dead, and seeing that nothing more could be done immediately, the mail cart man returned to his own animal, which was uninjured. You was on the wrong side, he said. I am bound to go on with the mail bag, so that the best things for you to do is to bide here for you with your load. I'll send somebody to help as soon as I can. It is getting daylight, and you have nothing to fear. He mounted and sped on his way, while Tess stood and waited. The atmosphere turned pale. The birds shook themselves, and the hedges arose and twittered. The lane showed all its white feathers, features, and Tess showed hers, still whiter. The huge pool of blood in front of her was already assuming the iridescence of coagulation, and when the sun rose a hundred prismatic hues were reflected from it. Prince lay alongside, still and stark, his eyes half open, the hole in his chest looking scarcely large enough to have let out all the, that had animated him. "'Tis all my doing, all mine,' the girl cried, gazing at the spectacle. "'No excuse for me, none. "'What will mother and father live on now? "'Aby, Aby,' she shook the child, "'who had slept soundly through the whole disaster. "'We can't go on with our load. "'Prince is killed.' "'When Abraham realized all, "'the furrows of fifty years were extemporized on his young face.' Why, I danced and laughed only yesterday, she went on to herself, to think that I was such a fool. Tis because we be on a blighted star and not a sound one, isn't it, Tess? murmured Abraham through his tears. 
In silence they waited through an interval which seemed endless. At length a sound and an approaching object proved to them that the driver of the mail car had been as good as his word. A farmer's man from near Stour Castle came up, leading a strong cob. He was harnessed to the wagon of beehives in the place of Prince and the load taken on toward Casterbridge. The evening of the same day saw the empty wagon reach again the spot of the accident. Prince had lain there in the ditch since the morning, but the place of the blood pool was still visible in the middle of the road. Though scratched and scraped over by passing vehicles, all that was left of Prince was now hoisted into the wagon he had formerly hauled, and with his hooves in the air and his shoes shining in the sudding sunlight, he retraced the eight or nine miles to Marlot. Tess had gone back earlier. How to break the news was more than she could think. It was a relief to her tongue to find from the faces of her parents that they already knew of their loss, though this had not lessened the self-reproach which she continued to heap upon herself for her negligence. But the very shiftlessness of the household rendered the misfortune a less terrifying one to them than it would have been to a thriving family, though in the present case it meant ruin and in the other it would have only meant inconvenience. But in the Derbyfield countenances there was nothing of the red wrath that would have burnt upon the girl from parents more ambitious from her welfare. Nobody blamed Tess as she blamed herself when it was discovered that the knacker and tanner would give only a few shillings for Prince's car carcass because of his decrepitude, Derbyfield rose to the occasion. No, said he stoically. I won't sell his old body. When we Derbyvilles was knights of the land, we didn't sell our charges for cat's meat. Let them keep their shillings. He've served me well in his lifetime, and I won't part from him now. He worked harder the next day in digging a grave for Prince in the garden than he had worked for months to grow a crop for his family. When the hole was ready, Derbyfield and his wife tied a rope around the horse and dragged him up the path towards it, the children following in funeral train. Abraham and Liza Lou sobbed, hope and modesty discharged their griefs in loud blares which echoed from the walls, and when Prince was tumbled and they gathered round the graves, the breadwinner had been taken away from them. What would they do? Has he gone to heaven? asked Abraham between the sobs. Then Derby Field began to shovel to the earth, and the children cried anew, all except Tess. Her face was dry and pale, as though she regarded herself in the light of a murderess.